Good morning. Welcome to Hope Fellowship of Somerset. We meet every week at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time uh, for fun, food, fellowship, mayhem, and whatever else mischief we can get into. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Today is October the 10th, 2021. How unbelievable is that? We're, all, we're th almost three quarters of the way through the end of the year. We are, or we are there. No, we are there because we it's October, are. November, December. Yeah. We are walking in, we are walking into new paradigms of prophecy. We are walking into the time of Jacob's trouble. We are walking into the time of our glorious removal from this planet. And all I can say is, yea and amen, and Maranatha, come quickly, Master Yeshua, come quickly. We've been on a series of, of um, sermons on where Yeshua, or Jesus, is found in the Old Covenant writings, which many call the Old Testament. And... Despite the mistake that I have on the front of my sermon here, this is part eight of before there was a beginning, the word existed. The word is the living expression of our triune Elohim. For those of you who are in India and Pakistan um, and other places in your general region, I am not a Jesus only or Yeshua only pastor. I firmly completely and correctly believe in the triune Elohim, whom many of you call God. He is triune. He consists of Yahweh the Father, Yahweh the Son, and Yahweh the Holy Spirit. That can never change and it will never change. For so for the doctrines of demons that are being spread in your lands, please, please, please look up the scriptures concerning the triune Most High. For our friends who are in Uganda, who are watching us on YouTube, I pray that you will be encouraged and strengthened with all might and power according to the marvelous work that the Holy Spirit is working in you, in Yeshua. These are sermons that need to be understood, need to be digested, need to be searched out to make sure, as the Thessalonians did, that these things be true. As I preach this sermon, I hope that our friends in um, Cuba will see how quickly Messiah is coming for his faithful bride. So I'm going to start out with prayer, and then we're going to get on with the show. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is true all the time. And in comparison to your word, we are but liars. I pray, Father, that your word will permeate the airwaves and that it will land in the hearts of those who don't believe. That it will put a seed of truth in their hearts that will grow and expand and bear fruit, and that they would find Messiah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. As I deliver this message, Father, I, as I prayed this morning, that I will be a conduit of truth, that I will be uh, address this powerfully, and that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. If there's anything in this sermon you don't want me to say, then stop me in my tracks. And everything that you want to be heard, let those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, following fatherly advice. My father told me I missed parts of the lawn when I cut it. He went on to tell me, or tell, people are more respected when they do stand-up work. My father has always been a wise man, so I followed his wishes. I became a comedian. <laughs> John, scripture reading is John 1, 1 through 5. My wife was hiding from me. Even before there was a beginning, the word, the living expression, was already active. And the word, the living expression, was with Yahweh, yet fully Elohim. They were together, face to face, in the beginning, 
and through his creative inspiration, this living expression made all things, for nothing has existence apart from him. A fountain of life was in him, for his life is life for all humanity. And this light never fails to shine through darkness, light that darkness could not overcome. In order to understand Messiah, uh, Messiah's preexistence in the universe, we must first discern how he is found in the pages of Elohim's word. Types and shadows of Yahweh's Messiah and Savior of the world have been a mystery to humanity. But there is good news. Yahweh has given us the keys to understanding the things that are hidden. Matthew 13.11 declares, You have been given the intimate experience of insight into the hidden mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom. But they, referring to unbelievers, have not. Revelation knowledge is given to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see what is concealed in the types and shadows of the image and body of Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of Yahweh. 1 Corinthians 4.1 tells us, Look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Messiah who have been put in charge of explaining Yahweh's mysteries. The, that privilege is given to the body of Messiah. The time for these secrets, is to, uh, to, secrets to be unlocked is now. We are stewards of the mysteries of Messiah, so we can co-labor together to hasten his return. Romans 16, 25 through 27 reveals, All glory to Yahweh, who is able to make you strong, just as my good news message says. This message about Yeshua the Messiah has revealed his plan for you foreigners, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now, as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal Yahweh has commanded, this message is made known to all foreigners everywhere so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise Yahweh through Yeshua the Messiah forever. Amen. Both Old and New Covenant writings are brimming with puzzle pieces of, the Ad of Adonai Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, who was destined to bring saving grace to Abraham's seed and to the all nations. Adonai has always existed. He was with Yahweh the Father even before the foundation stone of creation of the, of the universe was laid. Nothing could exist without Adonai speaking it into existence. John 1, 1 through 3 declares, Even before there was a beginning, the Word, the living expression, was already active. And the Word... The living expression was with Yahweh, yet fully Elohim. They were together face to face in the very beginning. And through his creative inspiration, this living expression made all things, for nothing has, existed, has existence apart from him. It is according to Yahweh's glory to conceal and humanity's glory to reveal. We are responsible to put the pieces together to discover Yeshua, the Son of Man, from the types and shadows in Scripture. Yeshua's image is seen in the form of the messenger of Yahweh in Genesis 22.15 and Exodus 3.2. He is seen as King Melchizedek, concealed in Genesis 14.18-20, and revealed in Hebrews 7.1-10. Yeshua's type and shadow is revealed in the fire by night and the cloud by day in Deuteronomy 1.33, when the descendants of Israel wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. Yeshua is the temple not built with hands, as he declared in Matthew 12.6 and in Mark 14.58. His attributes appear in the articles of worship within Yahweh's Holy of Holies in Exodus 25. 31 through 40. 
Yeshua was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread in Hebrew. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. Yeshua is seen as the symbol of the Jewish prayer shawl in Numbers 15. Numbers 15, 37 through 40 tells us, Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, For generations to come they must wear tassels on the corners of their shawls with violet threads and in each tassel. Whenever you look at the threads in, in the tassel, you will remember all Yahweh's commands and obey them. Then you will not do whatever you want and go after whatever you see, as if you were chasing after prostitutes. You will remember to obey all my commands, and you will be holy to your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of Egypt to be your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Yeshua represented the commandments of the Torah in types and shadows. He lived an exemplary life uh, consecrated to Yahweh. Israel's Messiah appeared as Yahweh's living expression as a human. Yeshua fulfilled all of the Torah and Yahweh's instructions when he offered his life to Yahweh the Father's will to Yahweh the Father's will, and because of his love for humanity, he created, as seen in Matthew 5.17. The name of Yeshua in Hebrew means the salvation of Yahweh, or Yahweh saves. His name is found over 152 times in the Old Covenant. The Tanakh reveals what the New Testament Covenant reveals. Paul always referred to the Tanakh, the Old Covenant writings, when he preached the good news message about Yeshua. When Paul preached Messiah crucified, his thoughts were in Isaiah 50-54. Acts 28, 22 and 23 declares, We, referring to the Roman Jews, are anxious to hear you, you present your views regarding this messianic sect we have been hearing about, for people everywhere are speaking against it. So they set a time to meet with Paul. On that day... An even greater crowd gathered where he was staying. From morning until evening, Paul taught them, opening up the truths of Yahweh's kingdom. With convincing arguments from both the Torah and the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Yeshua. Paul wrote in Hebrews 10.1 a very important and profound truth concerning the Torah and the Messiah found in it through its types and shadows, which he called crude outlines of Yeshua. Hebrews 10.1 reveals, The old system of living under the Torah presented us with only a faint shadow, a crude outline of the reality of the wonderful blessings to come. Even with its steady stream of sacrifices offered year after year, there was still nothing that could make our hearts perfect before Yahweh. In Jewish culture, there are two Moedim, or appointed times, of Yahweh that are the most important types and shadows of that which was to come. Passover is the first from Exodus 12. As Israel's deliverance progressed, Pharaoh refused to release the Israelites to Moses. He endured nine terrible plagues for his rebellion. The tenth plague brought the death, angel of death into the picture. As he passed over Egypt, the firstborn offering of the Egyptians and their animals died unless the Passover's lamb, Passover lamb's blood was placed on the doorposts of each home, both Israelite and Egyptian. Miraculously, both Israelite and Egyptian firstborn children were saved because they killed a lamb according to Moses' instructions. They placed the blood over their doorposts, and which protected them. Now, I didn't put this in my sermon, but I'm going to add it here. The Israelites and the Egyptians served as types and shadows of believing, believing Jews and believing, uh, believing Christians. They are types and shadows of what was yet to come. And I didn't think about that then, I, I did, do now. So think about that. They represented two people groups that become one. 
and are saved and protected under the blood of Yeshua. The Israelites, the Jews, and the Egyptians, the non-Jews, yet they, they obeyed Yahweh and their families were saved because the blood of the Lamb covers all of our sins. The Lamb which was chosen and sacrificed for each family of Israel was an animal without spot or blemish. It was roasted and eaten with unleavened bread with bitter herbs, a type of Yeshua. This was not only the landmark event for Israel. The Lamb provided a type and shadow of the good news message of Yeshua. The Lamb was a type and shadow of the spotless Lamb of Elohim. He had no sin, yet he carried in his body the transgression of fallen humanity from all eras and ages on Golgotha in Isaiah 53. Yeshua's sacrifice became the seminal event for all humanity. Isaiah 53.5 proclaims, It was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced, and because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured the punishment that made us completely whole, and in his wounding we found our healing. The other appointed time is Yom Kippur, uh, or the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur is Yahweh's holiest moed, or appointed time. The priest represented Israelites before Yahweh. Two goats were used. One was sacrificed for forgiveness of sin. The other was a substitute for Israel, Israelite sins. Their sins were ceremonially placed on it by the priest, and then it was released into the wilderness. The blameless goat became the scapegoat of, for Israel's righteousness. The scapegoat was a type and shadow of the forgiveness received from Messiah's atoning work on the cross. Leviticus 23, 27-36 Passover and Yom Kippur stand as the bookends of Yahweh's word, the living expression of the types and shadows that reveal all events seen throughout Scripture and His appointed times. These appointed times are bookends which point to the Son of Man, Yeshua the Messiah, who is the radiant glory of Yahweh and the exact rep representation of being proclaimed in Hebrews 1, 1 3. Other examples of foreshadowing of Yeshua emerge in each page of the Jewish holidays. After Passover comes first fruits, when Yeshua fulfills the first fruits in his resurrection from the dead. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the believers in Jerusalem. Then another shadow, Shavuot or Pentecost, the wheat harvest points to Messiah's harvest of fallen humanity. Jewish tradition says that the Torah was given during Shavuot Passover, which represents the Holy Spirit filling those who waited in Jerusalem with power and boldness to be Yeshua's witnesses. Through the Holy Spirit, the Torah is written upon our hearts when we believe in Him and confess that Yeshua the Messiah is Adonai to the glory of Yahweh the Father, as read in Philippians 2. There are three fall feasts, Moedim, or appointed times, Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, a picture of Yeshua returning to earth for those who believe, and then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Tabernacles, or Sukkot, will be fulfilled after the tribulation period, when Yahweh's kingdom will reign under the kingship of Messiah on the, over the earth. Messiah's bride will then reign at his side. And that takes us to point one. We see at the end of Psalm 119 that there are contrasts between believers and unbelievers. Isaiah begins at this point to describe the suffering servant. King David understood that the wicked would not be saved, as Paul later declared in Galatians 5. He understood that their sinfulness was rooted in their refusal to seek Yahweh through his word. Psalm 119, 155 says, The wicked are distant from Yeshua, for they have not searched for your message of truth. 
King David committed loyalty to Yeshua in contrast to rebellion and wicked of the wicked. His proclamation of commitment is not an expression of pride, but rather it is an appeal to Abba Yahweh's heart. King David called on Yahweh to save him from his enemies. They were wicked and repugnant. King David obeyed to Yahweh's Torah. They did not. It is for this purpose he called on Yahweh for help. If you do not search for something that is important to you, you will not find it. They have not searched for your message of truth. Yeshua's mysteries are revealed only to his followers. Isaiah 51, 5 and 6 says, My righteousness is near. My Yeshua is on the way. I will bring justice to people. The islands put their hope in me and they wait eagerly for me and for my powerful arm. Lift your eyes to the heavenly realms and look at the earth far below. Though the heavens disappear like smoke, though the earth wears out like a garment, and though all the people will die like gnats, my Yeshua will endure forever, and my righteousness will never end. Those whose hearts are knit to this world and its religious, commercial, and political systems will be cast into Tartarus along with Satan, death, and hell if they do not repent and receive Messiah. Yeshua will endure forever and my righteousness will never end. Yeshua the Messiah is always the same throughout the past, the present, and the future. His righteousness will never come to an end. We do not have to be afraid that Yeshua will change his mind, his character, or his righteousness. He will not change his mind about our salvation. He will keep us in his hands forever and ever. There is a play on words between the arm of Yahweh and his provision for, of salvation. Yahweh's arm in Isaiah 51.5 refers to Messiah, the servant of Yesh Yahweh, Yeshua, referred to Yahweh's arm. John 12, 38 asks, Despite all the miraculous signs Yeshua had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had prophesied. Yahweh, who has believed our message? To whom has Yahweh revealed his powerful arm? Isaiah says, My righteousness, which is a result of salvation, is drawing quickly near. My Yeshua is on the way, and my arm, referring to Yahweh's judgment, will bring justice to the foreign nations. The islands are seen as the ends of the earth in prophetic scripture. The islands put their hope in me, and they wait eagerly for me and my powerful arm. Yeshua is Yahweh's powerful arm. Having spelled out that Yeshua will come by means of the arm of Yahweh's servant, in Isaiah 51.5 and Isaiah 51.6 points out that salvation is only granted by Yeshua, the servant, but lasts for all eternity. John 10.27-30 reveals, My own sheep hear my voice, and I know each one, and they will follow me. I give to them the gift of eternal life, and they will never be lost, and no one has the power to snatch them out of my hands. My Father, who has given them to me as his gift, is the mightiest of all, and no one has the power to snatch them from my Father's care. The Father and I are one. Those who erroneously declare that a person can lose his or her salvation by means of their work know not the Father in heaven. No one, not even us, can ever be, be wrested from Yahweh's hands. The idea Isaiah puts forth in Isaiah 51 is that if Israel remembers her past history with Yahweh and pays attention to his word, he will give her the confidence that his Messiah, Yeshua, is coming. Isaiah 51, 7 and 8 says, Listen to me. You people who know righteousness, you people who have my teachings in your hearts, do not be afraid of being insulted by people, 
Do not be discouraged by their ridicule. Moths will eat them like clothing. Worms will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, and my Yeshua will endure throughout every generation. Isaiah 51, 7 and 8 offers Yahweh's eternal comfort and deliverance in Yeshua against all of our enemies. Listen to me, you people who know righteousness, you people who have my teachings in your hearts. The eternal salvation and favor promised to Yahweh's people, Israel, and us, the new Israel, should provide us with the courage and strength to withstand the assaults and abuse of the unrighteous. Isaiah 51, 7 and 8, there, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 51, 7 and 8, there is a message of comfort that is provided to Yahweh's faithful ones. We know it was told to the faithful ones because we know what is right and have his Torah in our hearts. Psalm 119.11 declares, I consider your word to be my greatest treasure, and I treasure it in my heart to keep me from committing sin's treason against you. Yahweh's salvation in Yeshua will last forever. His righteousness will never fail. We must take courage and not be fearful. To those who love Yahweh and listen to Yeshua, the word will prevail. And, of course, this isn't in the sermon, but I can tell you this. I read the last page of the Bible, and we win. Amen? Do not fear the criticism of fallen humanity or fallen leaders of the world, or be terrified of their insults. Do not be afraid of being insulted by people. Do not be discouraged by their ridicule. The world hates Yeshua. It hates us. Why fear? Moths will eat them like clothing. Worms will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, and my Yeshua will be with us forever. We see in Isaiah 52.10 that our divine King, Yeshua, will rescue, redeem, and restore his people, and demonstrate his complete and ultimate salvation to all nations, peoples, tribes, and languages. Isaiah 52.10 says, Yahweh has unveiled his holy arm before the eyes of all nations. To the ends of the earth, everyone everywhere will see Yeshua of our Elohim. Yahweh has unveiled his holy arm before the eyes of all nations. This passage reveals Yeshua's second appearance after the tribulation and portrays him as being ready to take action against his enemies. Isaiah portrays Yeshua with his sleeves rolled up and ready to clean house in his universe. The truth is that all nations through, the, through to the ends of the earth will see Yeshua's reappearance very soon. Isaiah 52.10's portrayal of Yeshua's return mirrors Revelation 1.7, which says, Now it is about to be realized. Look, or pay attention. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So will it be. Amen. When Yahweh reveals his holy arm, everyone who lives on the earth will see his son Yeshua. Isaiah provides a constant synergy between Yahweh's holy arm and salvation in his son Yeshua. There is an interesting find in the Qumran Caves, uh, Cave 11. It was a document that postulated that rabbis of Isaiah's days believed that Yeshua in Isaiah 52, 7 through 10 revealed that he was indeed Melchizedek. Isaiah 52, 7 through 10 proclaims the good news message uh, and the advent of Yahweh's kingdom. Isaiah 52, 7 reveals a key text concerning the royal um, priest Melchizedek from Qumran Cave 11. This text describes both the appearance of the heavenly deliverer as being called Melchizedek, the royal high priest, and of Yeshua the Messiah, Yahweh's messenger of his good news message. The messenger of Isaiah 52, 7-10 was understood to be the Messiah, who is also Melchizedek, bringing the Day of Atonement at the end of the 10th Jubilee following Israel's ex exile to Babylon. Mark 1.15 fulfills this when John the baptizer, who had a spirit similar to Isaiah, 
said, At last the fulfillment of the age has come. It is time for Yahweh's kingdom to be experienced in its fullness. And that takes us to point two. Isaiah 55, 1 through 56, 8 reveals that Yahweh offers salvation through his Messiah, Yeshua, to both Israel and non-Jewish nations from all eras. Isaiah 56 provides a glimpse into the far future of eschatological prophecy describing life during the Messianic Kingdom. Eschatology is the study of last day's ultimate prophetic fulfillment. Isaiah 56 refers to the Great Commission that was commanded to believers in 28, 18 through 20. Yeshua went to his and revealed all authority in heaven and earth on earth it has been given to me. Because of this, Yeshua said, Now, wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was alluded to in Isaiah 55 and 56. Yeshua encouraged and exhorted believers, Teach them to faithfully follow all I have commanded you, and never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. The foundational command in, of Elohim's word is the Great Commission. It is either directly alluded to or indirectly mentioned on every page of Elohim's word, mostly revealed in types and shadows. In Genesis, we see the good news message of Yahweh hidden in the text of Genesis 1.9. But in the book of Revelation, we see its ultimate fulfillment for every tribe, language, people, and nation. Every person saved around, from around the world, from all ages and eras, since creation, are seen around Yahweh's throne in Revelation 1, 5, 9, 11, 9, and 14, 6. The Great Commission culminates in Revelation 22. Yahweh told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all families on earth will be blessed through you in Genesis 12.3. Yahweh made that promise to all. The offer of salvation has been made to every tribe, language, people, and nation on the face of the earth, from all eras and ages up to the present, and it will extend into the future. This is seen throughout Elohim's written word. This means, listen up here. We actually have in Genesis 12, 3, the Great Commission. Yeshua did not give believers the Great Commission. He revealed the Great Commission in Genesis 12, 3. The Great Commission began in Genesis and is revealed throughout the Old Covenant writings. It flows directly and indirectly throughout all 66 books. It is Yahweh's cohesive theme of his word. The Great Commission unifies all 66 books of Elohim's word to form one theme. It is our Father's desire to see everyone on earth saved through his one and only Son, Yeshua, the Messiah. Isaiah 56 one says, Yahweh says to his people, Promote the cause of justice. Do what is just and right. For soon my Yeshua will come and my righteousness in him will be revealed. This is a far-reaching eschatological prophecy to the Messianic Kingdom, where we see Yahweh in his Son gathering all of his people from all eras of time and ages and placing them in Jerusalem. Isaiah 56 serves as Yahweh's transition between Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 66. It is a parallel to Yahweh's gathering of his people in 66, 18 through 24. Isaiah 50 through 54 reveals Yeshua's salvation to non-Jewish nations. I didn't say that right. Yeshua's salvation to non-Jewish nations. In Isaiah 56, 1, Isaiah begins to unpack and reveal the implications of when Yahweh gathers his people and children and sends them to earth to reign in Yeshua's millennial messianic kingdom. Messiah's millennial kingdom will consist of both Israel and non-Jewish believers. This is the promise found in the new covenant. It will not be performance-based, but relationship-based. 
Yahweh's people are those who reveal a living relationship with him in their lives through his Son and our Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. We never knew Abraham, but we are his descendants. To all who receive Yeshua and believe in his name, Yeshua gives the right to become the children of Yahweh in John 1.12. It is not the result of genealogy, but faith that marks Yahweh's children. Moses gave 613 commandments on Mount Sinai. David went on to reduce them to 11 commandments. They are mentioned in Psalm 15, which he wrote. Isaiah further reduced these 11 commandments to 6 in Isaiah 33, 15. Micah reduced 6 to 3 in Micah 6, 8. Isaiah again reduced the 3 to 2 in Isaiah 56, 1. Habakkuk reduced these commandments to one. Messiah quoted it in the good news messages of Mar Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It says, the righteous person will live by faith in Habakkuk 2.4. Yahweh revealed soon my Yeshua will come in Isaiah 56.1. Isaiah and other prophets expected the mess messianic kingdom to be established Im immediately. Why wasn't it a mystery to them? Ephesians 3.9 reveals, He, Yahweh, allowed me to explain the way this mystery works. Yahweh, who created all things, kept it hidden in the past. A biblical mystery is different than what we currently think is still, think is still considered a mystery, but is not something that cannot be discovered. It is something hidden by Yahweh and is now revealed. Romans 16.25 also reveals, All glory to Yahweh who is able to make you strong, just as my good news message says. This message is about Yeshua the Messiah. Uh, I'm sorry, this message about Yeshua the Messiah has revealed his plan for you foreigners, a plan kept from the beginning of time. Israel's spiritual condition is described in Isaiah 59, 4, 11, and 14 and 15. We see, except for Israel's believing remnant, she will be thoroughly corrupt and without justice or righteousness. Isaiah 59, 10 through 11 says, We are like the blind groping along a wall, inching along in the dark like those who cannot see. We stumble around in broad daylight like it was night. Like a walking dead, like the walking dead. We all growl like bears. We coo like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. We hope for Yeshua, but he is far from us. Spiritually, she was, is, and will be walking in darkness, blind to her Messiah and dead in her sins. Israel will eventually confess the truth to the sinfulness that she was accused of in Isaiah 59 1 through 8. What has, is, and will continue with Israel precedes, precedes Messiah's return after the tribulation period and the establishment of King Yeshua's millennial messianic kingdom in Jerusalem and on the earth. Israel must make a national confession of her sin in rejecting Yeshua the Messiah and ask him to return. This will occur near the end of the great tribulation period, three days before his return. Hosea 6, 1 and 2 declares, Let us return to Yahweh. Even though he has torn us to pieces, he will heal us. Even though he has wounded us, he will bandage our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, we, he will raise us so that we may live in his presence. That is not the earth, my friends, as some people postulate. That is heaven. Another mystery to note in this passage is the phrase, He will raise us up so that we may live in His presence. This is a rapture promise to Israel from Yahweh Himself to raise her up into His heaven. The Hebrew word for the phrase, raise us up, is kum. It means to rise up, cause to raise up, to carry out, or catch up. It is one of the Hebrew equivalents to the Greek word harpazo meaning to catch up. As Israel's spiritual scales fall from her co collective eyes, 
she begins to confess how she turned her back on Messiah. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like those without eyes. Up until that time, spiritual blindness and death had characterized Israel. She will realize that not only has there been no justice, but even worse, there has no, been no deliverance or salvation. The sea of sin in which all of fallen humanity swims in has drowned all hope for light for those who are steeped in it. Every one of us yearn for Messiah's light, but because of sin, all we see is darkness. The image of lost sinners groping in the dark like blind men, carrying, or I mean crying and mourning for the light of salvation, Yeshua, is deeply moving and painful. It is the condition of humanity apart from Messiah. And the final point, Yeshua the Messiah is revealed to be Israel's and our supernatural protector. He will restore Israel to Jerusalem and us during his messianic kingdom. Messiah saw that there was no man, there was no intercessor. Not only was the state of Yahweh's people deplorable, there was no one among them who took the lead to get them right. Who would lead Israel's to righteousness? He could not be found. Who was the intercessor who would plead Yahweh's case to Israel and bring her to repentance? No intercessor could be found. Isaiah 59, 16, and 17 says, He, the Messiah, was astonished to see there, there was no intercessor, not even one, who would rescue the oppressed. So then his own mighty power was released to deliver, and his own righteousness supported him. He, has, he put on righteousness as body armor. Yeshua for a helmet, a garment for warring vengeance, was his uniform and passion his cape. So then his own mighty power was released to, to deliver. Yahweh waited for a rebellious Israel to repent to him. He waited for an intercessor to plead before him to lead Israel back to him. No intercessor arose. Yeshua arose and interceded for Israel before Yahweh. If a mere human being or intercessor would have stepped up to intercede, it may have saved Israel from her, uh, of, from her calamities. Yahweh waited to work in partnership with his son, Yeshua the Messiah. He waited for his true intercessor, Yeshua, to mediate for Israel and fallen humanity so Yahweh could work through him. He put on righteousness as his body armor, Yeshua for a helmet. No person stepped up to work with Yahweh. To put his armor on his armor and destroy his enemies, protect his people, and glorify his name. Most Western theologians or teachers do not see the connection between Isaiah 59, 17, and 18, and Paul's exhortations to put on all of Yahweh's armor to wage supernatural battle in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. In Ephesians 2, 6, 10 through 17, Paul calls the armor, the whole armor of Yahweh. It is his armor in the sense that it belongs to him. He uses it from Isaiah 59, 17, and 18. We are told to wear it for spiritual battle. We see the connection. We must put on the armor of Yahweh to wage supernatural battle, to expand his son's kingdom, and to battle for his glory. Yahweh uses his armor to work in and through us. He put on righteousness as his body armor, Yeshua for a helmet, a garment of warring vengeance was his uniform, and passion his cape. This pictures Yeshua stepping in up to intervene for Israel. Paul used uh, Isaiah 59.17 to describe the full armor of Yahweh. Many Western theologians or teachers are more familiar with the New Covenant writings than they are with the Old Covenant writings. It is the knowledge of Scripture that is Yahweh's full armor. It is the means of defeating Satan. Isaiah says Yeshua will wear his breastplate of righteousness and his helmet of salvation to prepare for war. Isaiah 60.18 says, No longer will you hear about violence in your land or desolation of, and destruction within your borders. You will call your walls Yeshua. 
and your gates praise. Jerusalem during the millennial messianic kingdom will be a place of permanency and security. No longer will violence be allowed in Israel, nor will ruin or destruction dwell within her borders. She will name her walls Yeshua and her gates praise. Yeshua and praise are two sides of the same coin. Yeshua is who Yahweh provided. Singing Yeshua's praise is how we respond to Yahweh. Peace, righteousness, and joy will be the hallmark of the Messiah's millennial kingdom. There will be no violence or destruction within Israel's borders. Every knee will bow to him in Philippians 2. No longer will you hear about violence in your land or desolation and destruction within your borders. You will call your walls Yeshua and your gates praise. This is a glam glorious transformation for Israel. From the violence of unrestrained bloodshed that was seen in Isaiah 59, 6-8, through 8, to walls Israel calls Yeshua, and to gates she calls praise. This will take place after Messiah returns for her. The ultimate fulfillment of these things await, for the millennial kingdom is not yet here yet. The, but the, kingdom of that, or the king of that kingdom is with us now, and wants us to finish the work to prepare for his return. Israel will, would not be silent until Jerusalem's cause was vindicated. Her fame and glory recognized universally. She and her children were reunited and Yahweh rejoiced over her as a bridegroom. The reason Jerusalem cannot have peace, her Messiah is not there yet. She will not see peace until the Prince of Peace comes takes over and begins his millennial messianic kingdom reign. Isaiah 62 1 says, For Zion's sake, I will not remain silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until its righteousness shines like the, the dawn and its Yeshua burns brightly like a torch. Isaiah prophesied at a time when Jerusalem was still function, a functioning city but was spiritually corrupt. He looked forward to the time when Jerusalem was empty because the Babylonians conquered her. Isaiah pro prophetically spoke comfort and assured Israel's discouraged and depressed citizens. Yahweh assured Israel that he would not rest until Jerusalem was restored by his son's shining righteousness. Isaiah prayed consistently for Israel. For Zion's sake, I will not remain silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until its righteousness shines like the dawn, and its Yeshua burns brightly like a torch. Isaiah's prayer is based on Yahweh's promises in chapters 60 and 61. In those chapters, Yahweh very clearly described what he intended for Israel in general, and Jerusalem, her capital in particular. Yahweh described the exaltation of Jerusalem during the Messiah's millennial kingdom. Knowing what Yahweh intends for Israel and Jerusalem encouraged Isaiah to intercede his will for his nation. Romans 9 reveals that Yahweh is sovereign and in control of the world and prophetic events that come to pass according to his will. He not only reveals the beginning from the end, but also the means. Romans 9.12 declares, Yahweh spoke these words before the sons had done anything good or bad, which proves that Yahweh calls people not on the basis of their good or bad works, but according to his divine purposes. And among the means are the prayers of believers. On the foundation of Yahweh's covenant, Isaiah prays for the fulfillment of Yahweh's promises for the restoration of abandoned and desolate Israel. In conclusion, Psalm 119, 155 tells us King David was committed in his loyalty to Yeshua in contrast to rebellion of the unrighteousness. His proclamation of commitment is an appeal to Abba Yahweh's loving heart. Isaiah 51, 5 and 6 warns that those whose hearts are knit to this world and its religious, commercial, and political systems will be cast into Tartarus along with Satan, death, and hell if they do not repent. Isaiah 51, 5, 
uh, 51, 7 and 8 reveals the permanence of Yeshua's righteousness and Yahweh's salvation, the passing nature of fallen humanity. We should not listen to or fear them, but listen to and love Abba Yahweh. Knowing that the righteousness and the salvation of Yeshua and Yahweh are permanent and that the opposition and mocking of the unrighteous are temporary at best, we should stand strong in faith. I, Psalm 52.10 reveals that Yahweh does not make his saving strength known merely to those who are to be immediately rescued. It is uh, his witness and testimony so they can see his Savior, Yeshua. And I made a mistake there. It's Isaiah 52.10. Isaiah 56.1 unpacks and reveals the implications of the time when Yahweh will gather his people and children up and send them to earth and to reign in Yeshua's millennial messianic kingdom. Isaiah 59.10 reveals the spiritual depth of Israel. It, is, it did, is, and will walk in darkness, blind to her Messiah, and dead in her sins. Israel will re eventually repent of the sinfulness she was accused of. In Isaiah 59, 11, Israel must make a national confession of her sin for rejecting Yeshua the Messiah. She must ask him to return. This occurs after the great tribulation, three days before his return. Paul connected Isaiah 59, 17 with Yahweh's full armor. Western theologians and teachers know the New Covenant writings better than the Old Covenant writings, so miss that particular connection. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, Paul calls this armor the whole armor of Yahweh. It is his armor in the sense that it belongs to him. He uses it in Isaiah 59, 17 and 18 and tells us to wear it during our spiritual battle. Isaiah prophesied in the years Jerusalem was still functioning a functioning city but was spiritually corrupt. He looked forward to the, uh, to, to, toward the time Jerusalem was empty, and Yahweh could completely restore her. In Benediction Romans 9, 7, and 8, physical descent from Abraham does not guarantee the inheritance, because Yahweh has said, through Isaac your descendants will be counted as part of your lineage. This confirms that it is not merely the natural offspring of Abraham who are considered the children of Yahweh, rather the children born because of Yahweh's promise it is those who can be traced back to the supernatural birth who are regarded as the children of Yahweh. It, Yahweh has blessed you and will protect you. Yahweh has smiled on you and has been gracious to you. Yahweh has shown you his favor and will give you his shalom, perfect and complete peace. Amen, amen, and amen.